Good afternoon, everyone. So pathological fractures in children are much more challenging than what you have seen till now because the size of the bone and the child is small. The bone quality is most of the time poor. We have limited implants available, and all these children have associated medical problems. Many benign and malignant conditions and many general conditions lead to pathological fractures, and you can see the list of causes for pathological fractures in various age groups. And a common cause in younger children is infection. Commonly seen in neglected or chronic osteomyelitis, and very, very commonly even in neonatal osteomyelitis. And the predisposing factors are basically underlying disuse osteopenia, presence of weak involucrum, and sometimes excessive surgical removal of bone during debridement. So the crux of treatment lies, as already talked about, is to control the infection with appropriate antibiotics and debridement. And once the infection is controlled, the fracture stabilization is very easy. It can heal just with plaster or sometimes made in external fixator or intramedullary nail. Many general conditions that weaken the bone we see in children, like osteogenesis imperfecta, osteopetrosis, and pycnodysostosis. Osteogenesis imperfecta is really challenging because we have small, fragile bones with very, very narrow canal. We have many times multiplanar deformities. We have presence of growth plates, which we have to avoid while fixing them. These adjacent joints may be stiff because of repeated immobilization during earlier fracture treatment. And they also have anesthesia-related risks like malignant hypothermia. So we have some special implants like this, fascia dual telescoping intramedullary rod, where we have males and female rods which fix at the physis and the rods expand as the child grows. But sometimes in mature children or when we have a very small canal, very narrow canal, we can even use simple nails or K-wires. And we can make these children ambulatory with these types of rods and splinting them. Medical management in the form of use of bisphosphonate, cyclic zolentronate has been proved to be beneficial in improvement of BMD and reduction in subsequent fracture risk. But we also have to supplement them with calcium and vitamin D because bisphosphonates may lead to hypocalcemia. Then we have a set of conditions like neuromuscular disorders like cerebral palsy, meningomyelocele, arthrogryposis, where simple things like manipulation during physiotherapy sessions or during convulsion, they can fracture their bone. Because these children are less mobile, and this lack of activity and limited weight bearing leads to disuse osteopenia in these children, many of them also have feeding and gastric disorders. So vitamin D deficiency is found in almost 40%. And many children, like in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, we put them on steroid, which weakens the bone. Or many of them are on anticonvulsant, again, which leads to interference with vitamin D metabolism and make the bone weak. There are challenges in these neuromuscular children because many of them have poor communication ability. So the diagnosis many times delayed. Some of them have sensory impairment where if you treat with conservative management, plaster sore, pressure sores are very common. They may be difficult to take these patients under anesthesia because they may have additional medical problems. And at the same time, they all need stable fixation because we have to mobilize them early in order to prevent disuse osteoporosis and prevent them from becoming disabled and unable to walk. We also have certain metabolic disorders like rickets and scurvy, which are associated with pathological fractures. Here again, as stated, the treatment of underlying metabolic abnormality is important. And once you correct that, most fractures respond to just cast or splint. But if you have slip capital femoral epiphysis or femur neck fractures, they may need surgery. And finally, we have a set of tumors, some benign and malignant, which can lead to pathological fractures, especially if the lesions are big or there is cortical erosion, then they can lead to pathological fractures. Histological diagnosis and appropriate staging is to be confirmed before treatment of all these pathological fractures. To go through some of them, unicameral bone cysts leading to fracture is common. 15% of them, especially in humerus, heal spontaneously, but the others may require curettage bone grafting and fixation. Aneurysmal bone cysts with fracture may heal, but cyst usually enlarges, so surgical treatment is recommended. Non-ossifying fibroma, again, commonly associated with fractures, and in these cases, fractures may heal spontaneously, but there are chances of refracture, so you have to splint them and keep them under observation. Enchondromatosis, especially if it is multiple enchondromatosis, has almost 30% fracture rate. 
And finally, malignant tumors like osteogenic sarcoma or Ewing sarcoma and some leukemia lymphoma also can come up with pathological fractures, but best to refer them to the oncologist for proper management, oncosurgeons. So in summary, pathological fractures in children is a challenging problem. Treatment of underlying condition is important. Fracture management should aim at achieving stability and early rehabilitation, and in, whenever possible, try to prevent these fractures as prevention is better than cure. Thank you. <laughs>